Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, wow, and I'm just in. And you're just All right, cool. Hi, guys. I'm Jenny. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. Alexa's like, um, if you need the mic, I'm like, I don't need the mic. But um, <laughs> I, I talk pretty loud. Um, you guys, since I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to skip the whole drunk log thing. I'll give you a, a little. I, I know. But I feel bad because a lot of people in here heard my story. I stab people. I bite them in the face. Like, I wreck a lot of shit. And it's super <laughs> exciting. But um, but uh, I'll give you, like, a little taste of what it was like. Like, I, I, I lost my my lost my house in the end I lost my house um I lost my kid and um and life was just really super shitty and sad and I went to the doctor and the doctor's like you're dying like if you don't quit drinking you're gonna die and like any alcoholic I was like hmm should should I quit like I was like and I thought about it for a year because you know like dying or drinking I was like it was a hard choice for me and uh luckily um I I finally came around you guys and um you know, the whole reason I didn't want to do a drunk log is because I really think it's important to talk about, like, the, the steps. So when I first got sober, um, I was really super excited because, like, I had spent 40, like, well, close to 35 years <laughs> drinking and doing drugs, which is, it was, I had a good run. And I had a lot of fun, and then I didn't, and then I got sick, and then there's all this stuff in my life that I blew up. So I, I, I got sober, and I would do steps one, two, and three like a boss like a boss and I had tons of commitments and I would like host people and drive you everywhere, but I wouldn't do my four step. I couldn't, I, I wasn't ready to take a searching and fearless moral inventory. And, um, and I, I did that for a year, like, like two years, I wouldn't do my four step. And, um, the minute something in my life got kind of hairy, I was dating this guy that helped me get in the rooms and get sober and he started drinking again. And, uh, and I, I, I didn't have the tools cause I hadn't worked the steps. And so I was like, Oh, he's pissed in the bed and like fighting all the time and super angry. Like I should do that too. And, uh, and I started drinking again and, um, and you know, life got really ugly, really fast. I had a one day relapse, you guys. And in that one day I managed to bite my partner's face, like completely off of his body in a fight that his mother broke apart. And I had to spit his face out of my mouth. Like that's how classy my relapse was. Sorry. And I was like, as I'm doing it, I'm all, I probably should quit drinking <laughs> again. Like I was like, and I got serious. And this time I, I put all those fears and all that shit aside. And I did one, two, and three. And I sat my drunk, dying ass down. And I did a four step and you guys, you know what? I didn't die. And it, and I told somebody all the horrible shit I did in my life and they didn't fucking care. I mean, you know, they were like, yeah, okay. Some of that shit's pretty bad, but like we get to fix it all now. And you know, I did, I was so scared that, that like in doing that four step and like having to really look in black and white at all the wreckage I had caused to my family and to my friends that I wasn't going to be able to like get through it. And I have to tell you guys, the most miraculous shit happens when you actually like do the steps. Cause I couldn't figure it out when I first got sober, I'd see all these people and like they started getting the jobs they wanted and like all this great shit started happening. And I was like, why isn't that happening for me? And they're like, what step are you on? And I was like, I'm not really doing those. And people would be like, Oh, you're cute. And, um, and, uh, I wanted all the cash and prizes, but I didn't want to do the work. Like I, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I wanted like the quick fix. I was like, is there like a workaround that I could do like where I don't have to do all these steps, but I did my four step and didn't die. And then I did my fifth step. And then I like looked at all these character defects that I thought had kept me alive for my whole life, you know? And, uh, I was horrified to give them up. They were like my, they were like my kids, you know, like they were kind of a part of me. And, um, but I, I realized that they weren't serving me anymore. I didn't need to lie. I used to lie when the truth was a better story. Cause I was just so used to it. I was like, it was my go-to knee jerk. And I, I quit lying and I, I, I started trusting people. And like, I used to think any, anything anybody ever said was a lie. Like people be like, have a nice day. And I'm like, you don't mean that motherfucker. You know, and I just like so bitter and like, uh, it was really sad that I just didn't trust anything anybody said. And I decided to stop doing that, you know? And then I got to the part where you have to make amends, which, like I, I, like I spared you guys the drunk a lot, but like I burned down an apartment complex. Like that was a fun one to make amends for. Um, you know, I had to find the city and try to give them money. They knocked down the apartments, but, um, and, uh, like that stuff sucks to have to go and like, look at that. And I apologize to people who were like, 
you know, I was like, what can I do? And they're like, fuck off and never talk to me again. And I was like, fair enough. You know what I mean? And that sucked, but I didn't die, you know, and I got to apologize to my kid. It's funny. I still, every time I see my son, I like, whenever he's going to leave, I start to cry. And he's like, is this the part where you apologize and tell me you're sorry for fucking up my life? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I make amends to my son every time I see him. And I've been doing this for like a couple years now, but, uh, but I get to do that. And I'm sober enough where like, I want to do that every time I see my kid at this point, he's like, let's let it go. Like we're okay. But, uh, but you know, like getting to apologize and getting to fix stuff was so like, the, I, people always say the four steps where it's at and that's where the magic happened. But for me, the ninth step, like getting to make amends and getting to fix all that stuff was the most spectacular thing that ever happened to me in my whole life. Like it blew the doors off my five minutes. I'm on it. Um, off my recovery. And it like, my life got so big and so full. And that's when I was like, this shit is amazing, you know? And then I got into like the, um, the paying it forward part where you get to go out and carry the message and help other people. And you guys, this is where like the real just of this program is like, I have sponsees. I have this one sponsee and I love her so much, but she's like, I want the promises. The promises aren't coming true for me. And I was like, do you know what the promises are? They're called the ninth step promises. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, what step are you on? And she's like, I'm on the fourth step. And I was like, well, I, this is hard for alcoholics to understand, but you don't get the ninth step promises on the fourth step. You get them when you're on your ninth step, you know, but we want that like instant gratification. We don't want to have to do all the work, you know, and she'll call me and she'll be like, convince me why I shouldn't drink. And I'm like, I don't know. You almost died. A plane had to make an emergency landing because you stopped breathing. That would probably be enough for most people. But, uh, <laughs> but I was like, it's not my job to convince you. It's my job to take her through the steps, you know? And I always tell her and she hates it, but I'm like, why don't you call somebody new? And I was like, and ask them how they are. And I said, and you don't get to tell them how you are. And she's like, but, well, why would I do that? And I'm like, I know it's hard for alcoholics to understand at first, but like when I call, like if I'm in my head and I'm feeling like a giant piece of shit and everything is wrong and I'm a horrible person, like if I call somebody new or even somebody else, there's another alcoholic. Some of the people I love most in the world are in this room. So I'm like, Shh. um, I feel better. I feel instantly better. Like I have people in my life who like, all I have to do is just hear their voice and I feel better, but it's so nice to get out of my own fucking way and to like talk to new people. You know, I, I, I do like a lot of stuff. I go to meetings around Thanksgiving time and invite everybody to my house. And my friends are like, you're a fucking lunatic, but it's the coolest thing. I have strangers in my house for Thanksgiving and it's like the most epic amazing stuff to like get to sit there with alcoholics who hate the holidays and don't have a place to go and like, let them come to my house and hang out with all my amazing friends. And, uh, and do that shit. And that's where like the, for me and my experience in the rooms, that's where the magic has, has been. Cause like, I mean, we're alcoholics. We can sit around and think about ourselves and our own shit. Like I could get so sad. Like I annoy a lot of people in the rooms cause I'm a really happy person, but people are like, you're so happy. And I'm like, but I choose to be, if I wanted to be, I could be sad all day. Like I could be bummed that my parents sucked. I could be bummed that, you know, like life's not the way I want it. And like, I consider dressing up now wearing sweatpants and you know, like, I mean, there's all kinds of things I could be bummed about, but it's like, I choose to be happy. Like I, I caught a big break. You guys, like, I feel like I won the fucking lottery by getting sober. I really do. I say it all the time, but I feel like the luckiest person in the world. Cause I stopped my heart two times. Like, you know, and you think like, Oh, it was all just luck. And it wasn't luck. It was the universe being like, you're not done yet, bitch. Like you got some work to do. You know, like you don't know. I OD right in front of a hospital, like across the street from a hospital. How lucky is that? You know? And it's like, that's the universe, like keeping me around. Cause I have work to do in this program and I get to go out and help people and, and, you know, all those breaks or whatever you want to call it. I really think it's my higher power, like put me out there to, to help other people. And, you know, I get to work with women all the time and it's, it's the greatest gift. I mean, there's sometimes where I'm like, I don't want to meet with this bitch. Like it's the last thing in the world I want to do. And I get my ass up and I go and meet with them. Anytime after I meet with a sponsor, I'm like, that was the single greatest thing I've done all week. And I always feel better. And it's like, that's where the magic of this, this program is for me. So if you're new, I know it can seem weird and Hey mama, 
and culty and super crazy. But um, I always joke, like, I've been in cults before, and uh, this is one of the better ones, hands down. I, I can tell you, way less weird shit happens in this one. So, um, so if you're new, like, stick around. Do the fucking steps. You'll feel so much better, I promise, and you won't die, and nobody's going to think that you're so horrible. There's nothing that you've ever done that somebody in here hasn't done ten times worse and you know, naked. Like, so just to remember that, like it's there, you, you've got it and you're in good company. So thanks for listening to me, you guys. I love AA and I love all you and I'm happy to be here. So thanks. My name is Jim and uh, I'm a real alcoholic of the hopeless variety. Hey Jim. Can you all hear me bend the back? Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'm really old. I'm, I'm 71, almost 72, and I got sober at 38, so that's kind of late compared to some of you young people. But if you do the math, in February, I'll have 34 years yeah. clean and sober. Damn, nice. And that's, that's, uh, that's scary. I mean, I just, I never would have thought that that would happen. I never would have thought that would happen. So um, I come by my disease, honestly. Uh, I am convinced that there are those of us who are genetically predisposed to alcoholism. I know a lot of us have drugs as part of our story. I have a little bit of it in there. It was If it didn't get in the way of my drinking, I would do it. That's basically it. <laughs> but uh, I'm a, just a good garden variety drunk. And my mother was a drunk. Um, I didn't realize she was an alcoholic until I was three years sober because I thought that was normal, the way she drank. And uh, she always had a beer between her legs when she'd drive the car, and that, you know, was okay in those days. We, I grew up in a rural area. We raised horses, and people worked hard and played hard and drank hard. And, and um, at Christmas time, she would always go wacko. I mean, she would throw Christmas trees through plate glass windows and break every dish in the house and and be a total basket case, and I never figured it out until I realized, oh, that's when she drank hard liquor. Uh, so she was just, it was like fire water for her. And I'm very much like that. I'm very much like that. So um, I did not drink as a teenager. Uh, it just wasn't available. Um, and I went off to college, and I can remember very clearly in my freshman year of college, a um, bunch of guys went down to the liquor store and they got a big thing of vodka and there was some stuff it was like Hawaiian punch out of a, a, a you know machine and we mixed it together and the next thing I remember is I awakened in the morning in my own vomit on my bed and my roommate was sleeping out in the hall and it never got any different. That was my first drunk. <laughs> and it never got any different. Um, and, uh, of course, I was a child of the 60s, and then I transferred to UC Santa Barbara, and in 68, our world fell apart. You know, uh, Dr. King had been killed, and Bobby Kennedy had been shot, and there were um, federal troops, uh, um, National Guard, rather, on, in the streets of, of Isla Vista, and, and they burnt down the Bank of America, and many of us dropped out. And I'm a gay man, and in those days, it, it just seemed like either you lived in the closet to, to participate in the culture, or you dropped out. And so I became a hippie. <laughs> and grew long hair, you know, and, and, and had a beard, and but I had a waistline. <laughs> and, you know, and ran naked on the beaches in, in Santa Barbara and lots of boys and things like that. And it was a wonderful thing. And did LSD and uh, smoked dope. For those of you who were into pot in those days, you got it in a baggie. We called them a lid. <laughs> and it was $10 for a lid, an ounce. I have no idea what it costs now. <laughs> and, you know, you'd lie on the floor and smoke your dope. And we would take these um, 
uh, like the plastic bags that your dry cleaning comes in and tie them to a hanger and set them on fire over the, the wastebasket and what we call them flaming groovies. And they go, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that <laughs> so I, you know, I, this is being a hippie in the 60s, you know. And then mescaline, oh, God, I love mescaline. That was so much fun. And we were in love with everybody. LSD, oh, God, really good LSD. And then, and then I, I knew something was wrong, and I was very unhappy in many ways. And... And uh, there were lots and lots of spiritual traditions around in those days. And experimenting, new age, it was new age, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, you know, it was, it was my time. So I got involved in this new age metaphysical group in San Diego, and that started a long period where I was separated from my disease. I didn't drink and I didn't use, not because I knew I was an alcoholic, but because the spiritual uh, practice required us to live a, a pure life. And I'm very glad of it. I'm very glad of it. So I did, you know, yoga and was a vegetarian and, you know, uh, all sorts of really cool things and still had long hair. Um, and then in 75, I met an amazing man, an Indian Swami, and moved into that particular spiritual tradition and did that for two and a half years. And I was living in an ashram in the Haight-Ashbury. And then when I left the ashram, the guy who was running it said, Jim, you know, you, you need to just go out and practice normal yoga. Just go have a beer with the guys. And that seemed okay. And I had a lot of repressed stuff around my sexuality. So um, I discovered uh, the South of Market scene in the late, this was in the late 70s at this point. And oh man, I just took to it. <laughs> so um, I, I learned quickly that I had this incredible talent. I would throw these sex parties that I was very good at getting people to have sex near me. Not <laughs> I, was, I used to call around the energy red and close to the ground, yeah. <laughs> so I opened a sex club. And I used to joke with people in those days, I only drank at work and on the job. <laughs> and it was fabulous. It was fabulous. And, and, you know, I couldn't walk into a bar without them, you know, lining up drinks. And I, I was a big spender and I made a lot of money and spent a lot of money, you know, just ego, ego, ego. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, all this stuff. Well, I progressed into third stage alcoholism in two years. It progressed that fast. And in 1982, my business partner said, um, this is after I had beaten up my lover in public, in my own club. And he said, I can't, I can't do business with an alcoholic. Well, you know, a reasonably sane person would, would think they might stop drinking. <laughs> and, you know, when we read, you know, more about alcoholism, I was convinced it was the lifestyle was the problem. So I sold my half of the club, but nothing really changed. And my drinking continued to progress. And by 1985, I was permanently 86th out of every bar south of market. <laughs> uh, I'm, I got a lot of money when I sold my half of the club. And so I lived on that, and I was about 60-some thousand dollars in debt. Because uh, my lifestyle hadn't really changed a whole lot. I was unemployed and unemployable at that point. And um, one of my other great loves is I'm, I I'm, uh, used to be a professional musician on and off through the years as a singer. 
And uh, at the time, I was working at Grace Cathedral. I was in the choir of men and boys there, from which I got fired. <laughs> but um, there, was, there was an event in, in the basement there, and I was there with a friend, a salty old dyke I used to do concerts with, <laughs> and we'd smoke cigars together after we'd perform. And I got really drunk. And um, no, back up, back up. Before that, so this was the second of of January of eighty five. Robin and I, this gal, got into a terrible fight, terrible fight, and um, she decided to stop drinking, and I was going to quit drinking to support her. <laughs> and she, rest her soul. Uh, stayed sober for 13 years. She died of a brain aneurysm. It was not related to her alcoholism, but she died sober. And um, I s didn't drink, was dry, till about April. And then I said, I've got this licked. So I was one of those people who had the idea that a period of abstinence qualified me to drink like a normal person. <laughs> and, you know, it, we just, it was the first time I'd ever tried to stop drinking. I've got it licked now. So I had a beer and nothing happened. So I said, well, a very good experiment. I think I'll try it again. So the scene at Grace Cathedral in the basement was the... Uh, <laughs> End of April. It was like the 30th of April. And I knew if I didn't get out of there, I was going to lose my job because I made a total ass of myself. So I, there was this guy, Joe T, and he was a guy, again, I'd had sex near for years. <laughs> we never had sex with each other. <laughs> he was in the program. He was actually a psychotherapist. And I went over there and I said, Joe, I, I don't know what's going on. You know, he says, well, the problem, Jim, is you're an alcoholic. And I went, oh, you know, I just, the word just, oh, you know. And then he explained to me about the allergy of the body and the strange mental twist. And I, I said, Joe, it's somewhere between the fifth beer and the tenth beer. And, and I just don't know what happens. And I never know. I never know. And he says, no, Jim, the problem is the first beer. And I said, you're crazy. Nobody ever got drunk on one beer. And he said, Jim, if you don't drink the first beer, you'll never get to the tenth beer. Duh. I mean, <laughs> now it seems so obvious. But at the time, it was revelatory. And he talked about the allergy of the body. And I believe it. I believe it because I think I'm genetically predisposed. I've got the demon gene. Once I start to drink, I can't stop till I black out or I run out of money or they throw me out of the fucking bar. <laughs> and uh, that all of that happened. So I, I'm a metabolic alcoholic. My body does not metabolize alcohol the way normal people do. Uh, I'm diabetic at this point in my life. I have a suspicion that science that one day will come to find that those of us who are alcoholic, we're, we're weird around sugar. You know, it's, there's, I think there's a relationship, you know. A lot of us are hypoglycemic and stuff like that. In the old-timey days, they used to tell you to eat candy. They don't do that as much anymore. But, you know, if you're having cravings, have some candy. You know, bring chocolate with you. They don't... Do you young people, do they suggest that anymore? Oh, yeah. No? Oh, they do. They do. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. But that was a big deal. So, but then he told me about the strange mental twist. And the strange mental twist is... The time will come that even though I've had all this terrible stuff happen, the thought of a drink will seem reasonable. I have no defense against that thought, and I'm living proof. I went through that. I cannot tell you how many times that happened. I'm not going to get drunk tonight. 
and then, all right. And, and I was just beer at the end. I was so sensitive to alcohol, all I drank was beer. And I'd get drunk really quickly, and then <clears throat> drink till I passed out. So I decided to give AA a try. I came into the rooms. And I remember my very first meeting, it was a show of shows in the Castro. I think it met on a Thursday night in those days. And I just wept and wept. The guy, I don't know how there was a human being who it was exactly like me. What an incredible coincidence. <laughs> I don't know who he was, but it, it was my story. It was my story. And then all these guys came around me and they said, Jim, we've been saving a seat for you. They were all my old customers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they just gathered around me like a posse and they took me to another meeting and, and, and they just held me up. They just held me up in those early days. And then I've always liked noon meetings. It splits my day well. So I discovered this meeting called High Noon in the city. It was at 19th and Guerrero in those days. And uh, it wasn't that big. It was maybe 40, 50 people. But it was uh, very diverse, and there was gay and straight and men and women and old and young and some real characters. Any of you here remember Cy Payne? Old attorney. Oh, man, what program. Or old Ben Wilson, the English guy with the wall eye, you know. <laughs> and Ted Ring. Ted Ring got to, uh, and I got sober at the same time. These wonderful people. A guy by the name of Mark Ryan said something I'll never forget. He said, AA is not a program of self-improvement. It's a program of self-abandonment. Oh. Oh, man, did I hang on to that for years. So uh, High Noon would meet five days a week. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm fine. And, and uh, you know, I got a service commitment because we had these really cool food that we'd serve at the meeting. So I that was my service commitment. I did it at a meeting for years. Finally, my sponsor, Skip Byron, any of you remember Skip Byron? I think they named a program out after him at Henry Olaf House. An old biker with a ponytail and snaggly teeth. And a wonderful man. God, he loved us. God, he loved us. But he says, I had to, had to give up that service commitment, let somebody else have a chance. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I learned about rotating service. What's that say? 20 minutes left? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, my first permanent, well, I'll talk about my first temporary sponsor, Ray H. It's the first day I walked into High Noon. And I said, will you be my sponsor? And he says, well, I'm leaving for Los Angeles in a week, but I'll get you started. So we walked down to the library on Mission Street. And he had me open up my big book to the chapter, Working with Others. And he said, read the first two sentences underline them and commit them to memory because they will save your life. And they say, practical experience shows us that nothing so much ensures immunity from drinking like intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. And I recommend that to all my newbies, my new kids that I sponsor. Uh, because it's it's the heart of what we do. I don't care what your problem is. Go work with another alcoholic. <laughs> go work with another alcoholic. I was I just have to cut to current time. So I was at a funeral on Monday, and there were people there whom I could have asked to give me a ride. I'm legally blind now. I can't drive. And, and I didn't. I had a hard time. I couldn't or wouldn't ask for help. So I'm walking up Alcatraz to, to College Avenue, and my old, crusty character defect, you know, having sex issues, that's, that's a good character defect. <laughs> yeah, I'm dealing with anger. Yeah, that's a good character defect. 
I have self pity. <laughs> so unsexy. <laughs> Now, let me say something. They say resentment is the killer for the newcomer. Self-pity is the killer for the old-timer. Thing on that. So, I started to laugh. Because the, what's underneath that is my difficulty still, after 33 years in the program, in asking for help. I know better. And it's still hard. It's still hard. So we're not fixed. We're not fixed. I'm still an alcoholic. I still have an alcoholic mind. So anyway, back with Ray. So he, he had me underline those things. And then I hooked up with Ben Wilson. And uh, he got me started on the steps. And it was Good old time EAA. We went through the big book. We read the big book. I did not write out a first step. I know people do, but nowhere in the big book does it say write out a, a, a first step. I don't think it's wrong. I just didn't do it. God, I've, I've never had a problem with the third step. Um, I had a little bit of a problem if God could and would, you know, in the ABCs. But I had I had hope I had hope, and I got to the fourth step. Now, um, one of the things that we have to understand on a fourth step it is not a litany of our resentments. <laughs> it is a searching and fearless moral inventory. So always we have to stay focused on what's my part, what's my part. So I did. And I can remember as I was going through my sex inventory, Ben's eyes were going like this. You know, so when you listen to a fifth step, the most important thing to do as a sponsor is don't fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished my fifth step, and then Ben said, well, is there anything you haven't told me? Do you have any secrets left? And I was still working at Grace at the time. And I was uh, being a, a, a server, an acolyte, at the noon mass twice a week. And uh, this is an Episcopal church. It's very Eucharistically centered. And in the Episcopal church at that time, I have no idea what they do now. But uh, the acolyte would do what they call the ablutions, meaning you do the dishes after mass. So, you know, there's a little bit of wine left in the cup. And you go, and you pour the water in, and if you... If you need to you do double ablutions with the wine. So I was doing this twice a week. And then I continued to do poppers. I'm surprised I don't have a scar on my thigh. Do people do poppers anymore? Oh yeah. yeah. I needed them for conversation. <laughs> and and uh, so I continued to do that and I had smoked a couple joints. And he said, Well you're not even sober and then he said, when was the last time you did any of this stuff? And I said, I can't remember. He said, okay, your sobriety date is today. So that was the 10th of February of 1986. And by God's grace, I've not had to have a drink or a drug since. But the reason I tell about that, like Dr. Bob, <coughs> the steps got me sober. The steps got me sober. So if you look into our literature... Dr. Bob had really struggled. He said that even to the day he died, the desire to drink never left him. But he had been on the program for a while, and then he had a terrible relapse. And he came home, and, and he was really smashed, and he got up the next day. He got on a, if I remember, it was a conference that he came back from. Can't quite remember, but he had the shakes terribly. He was a proctologist, <laughs> and he had surgery scheduled that morning. <laughs> Can you imagine a butt doctor going in there? With <laughs> I'm not making this up. It's air in the literature. <laughs> so they gave him some beer to, to calm his nerves. 
Then he disappeared after the surgery. Nobody knew where he was. He went all around town making his amends. After he made his amends, now there weren't even steps yet in those days. This is really early on. After he made his amends, love what you said, really, really good. He never had to have another drink. So continue to do the steps. And, um, you know, in my 33 years, I have never seen anybody get drunk from doing the steps too quickly. I have frequently seen people get drunk from doing them too slowly. Oh, I'm going to do one step a year. <laughs> in the old-timey days, they would do all the steps in a matter of days or weeks. You know, when Ben had me start on my first fourth step, he said that he did his first fourth step on the back of a matchbook. Now I think Ben may be close to 50 years sober. It wasn't his last fourth step. That was his first fourth step. It says in the book, we've made a good beginning. So we'll do these inventories over and over and over again. So when I walked out of there from doing that fifth step, I had a kind of cleanness and honesty. I had no secrets for the first time maybe in my life, at least as long as I can remember. And it didn't last. I think I probably told a lie within a few hours. <laughs> you know, it takes time to grasp and develop a manner of living that demands rigorous honesty. So I got into six and seven. And then eight and nine were hard because I owed a lot of money to a lot of people. And I had a lot of damaged relationships. I'm, I'm really an asshole, especially in relationships. And um, I had a lot of cleaning up to do. And I can remember the first person I did a financial amend to, I borrowed so much money from friends and stuff. Chuck Thayer, rest his soul. He's an army. And, and I said, I owe you, it was like just a few hundred dollars, which is a lot of money for me in those days. And he says, oh, Jim, don't worry about it. He forgave him. Oh, I like this nine-step business. <laughs> so I think the second one, the same thing happened. Then I had run some advertising in the BAR, and I went down there, and I said, I, I owe money for these ads. And I was expecting Bob, the publisher, to say, oh, we forgive it, Jim. No, he wanted his money. And I was so <laughs> upset. You know? yeah. But I paid it, and I paid it. You know, And you start with little amounts to little people. And this is so important. I sponsor lots of guys. I currently have 11 guys I'm working with. Some of them, like, like Mr. Steve, I've, I've been working with him for 30 years. He's currently in Indiana. We talk at least once a week. Wonderful relationship. He, t he loves bad jokes, as do I. So that's the core of our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, uh, there was a point to all this. Oh, sponsoring guys. So I had this one sponsee for a while. And he got sober really young. He was like in his early 20s. And a movie star, good looks. Breathtakingly beautiful boy. And, of course, everybody was all over him <laughs> in the program when he first came in. So he always had somebody who was a daddy figure taking care of him. And he never develop the capacity to be self-supporting through his own contributions. And he just owed so much money, and he was a part-time dog walker in his 30s at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and living with a guy that, you know, was daddy, you know, who made a lot of money, who took care of him, and of course, all those power issues and resentment. And I said to him, I won't mention his name, um, we've got to start on these financial amends. And he was just terrified. He couldn't. He couldn't. 
And I said, the first pe person you're going to make an amend to is yourself. I want you to take a small amount of money and put it in a savings account. That's for your retirement. <clears throat> you deserve that. And then old boy friends, like $50 a month. And we do it in time. 10 minutes, okay. Little amounts to little people. Well, now he's got a career. He flies all over the world. He and his partner own a house. You know, he's got a career. And all of that happened. He bought the promises by making his financial amends. So if you have fear about that, Trust, trust. Start paying the money back. Little amounts to little people. And watch the magic. The energy will loosen up. So I did all that stuff. Our steps, the 10, 11, and 12 are our maintenance steps. So I continue to do an inventory. Uh, my sponsor, Harry C., some of you may know him. He was 45 years sober last year. He's going to be 46 years sober coming up. And um, he's a priest. So, um, uh, as you, I told you, I've been a church musician. So he actually hired me back in 2000. That's where we met. So he's been my sponsor since 2004. But anyway, at one point I said, Harry, can your confessor be your sponsor? And he laughed and he said, mine is. So every year I do an in-depth inventory. No, very. I still use the fourth step format because I like it. It's familiar. But a deep examination of my character defects and my fears. I wish I had a sex inventory. <laughs> 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 but I don't. So, so I do that, and we do it within the, the, the frame of the sacrament of confession before Easter every year. That's the way I do it. Not everybody does it that way. Every night when my head hits the pillow, I thank God for keeping me sober. I go through my day, and I look at, at all that's happened. Did I fuck up anywhere? There's something I need to clean up. Is there something I could have done better? And then the way I go to sleep, I don't count sheep. I do blessing prayers. You know, I, I people that I know in my life who are... Struggling, I, I bless them. That's how I go to sleep. Is blessing people, and so it's, it's a neat practice. It's a neat practice. Uh, if I get balled up in the middle of the day or stuff like that, I do a spot inventory. If I've hurt someone or harmed it, I try to clean it up right away. And in any case, I'll pick up the phone, talk to another alcoholic, not just my sponsor. Any old alcoholic will do. Sometimes I dump it at a meeting if I have to. You know, but I, I don't hold on to stuff anymore. It's just I my tolerance for emotional pain. Does that say five minutes? Yes, sir. Oh, groovy. Okay, <laughs> we're getting there. Eleven <laughs> staff. Okay. <laughs> this, to me, is incredible. Now, Harry and I, we, we talk a lot about God. And one of the things we both believe, there's physical sobriety when we quit drinking. Then Bill writes a lot about emotional sobriety. But Harry and I think there's a level beyond that, and that's spiritual sobriety. And that's when we start to really deepen that connection. We take the time on a daily basis to have a hot date with God. <laughs> it's like any other relationship. You know, you've got to set aside the time. And we both do. We both do. It's, it's something we share a lot. We share a lot. But what the 11th step and having a really active 11 step. Maybe I'm sicker than most, <laughs> and I need a lot of prayer and meditation. I spend a lot of time in prayer and meditation. 
won't go into what my particular spiritual life is like. It's not important. What's important is that each one of each one of us find a way to to commune <coughs> with the infinite, to explore the ineffable, however you want to do it. But the program has no end spiritually, in depth or breadth. These very simple tools uh, form an incredible frame for deep spirituality, if you want it. Now, many of us will work just enough program to not drink and use. Maybe some of us will work, work a little bit more program so that we're not ripping the face off of the people we care about. <laughs> I haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> but I tell you, I tell you, it gets really good. Really good. <laughs> if we continue to deepen and broaden our spiritual life. The fear of death will leave you. How about that one? That's a third step. What a way to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. All right. You know, it's all okay. It's all okay. And this isn't just words. This comes from a regular practice of prayer and meditation. It's possible, and it's open to everybody. It's not for special people. It's anybody who has a hot date with God on a regular basis. Any of you in, in relationships where you get so busy, the two of you, that you have to set aside date night with your partner? Who has to do stuff like that? <laughs> Many people do who have busy lives. We do that with God. We get too busy. We get too busy. And then the final step is to give it away, to live a life of service. One of the things my alcoholic mind tells me, am I getting close? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> is getting what I want will make me happy. <laughs> I tell you that's a lie. Praying for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry it out and doing our best to live a life of service, of being useful. That makes us happy. Have a sponsor, you say, oh, Jim, you do all this service. You live a life of service. I'm just not that kind of person. And I said to him, I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> but I work at it because I want to be happy and joyous and free. So I'm done. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.